Thanks for inviting me here today. Um, I have some experience with healthcare in uh, British Columbia, but not, not with PHSA, so I'm happy to be here to talk about some of my latest work, and I think you'll find that it fits with a number of your values, specifically around daring to innovate and uh, uh, purpose, serving with purpose and uh, partnerships. And it starts with about the last 20 years of my research, I've been paying attention to large-scale engagement strategies as a way to accomplish a number of significant things that I'm interested in. And what I've learned about how those do or don't uh, support transformational change and the kind of leadership that's necessary to make that happen is what I'm going to be talking to you uh, today. I want to give you some examples. Now, unfortunately, these are all from business. I'm a business prof. I wish I had some healthcare examples from you that uh, came out of the research literature. They probably exist. I don't know them. But um, these are some examples of what I would call transformational change. Uh, Hunter Douglas is a... Uh, uh, Windows manufacturing is uh, an outfit in the southern U.S., primarily employs uh, Mexicans, many of whom are illiterate, um, uh, was able to engage their workforce uh, in order to produce these sorts of results, which I'm sure you'll see uh, are pretty astounding to do in just two years. Uh, Nutrimental Foods, this is a Brazilian company, so I want to so I want to make a couple points here by the, the, the cases I've, I've brought up because what I'll be talking about is how change happens when we engage the relevant stakeholders in that. Uh, with Hunter Douglas, we're talking about, again, a, a, a fairly, um, well, a largely illiterate workforce. With Nutrimental Foods, we're talking about a completely different culture. This is Brazil. Uh, at Nutrimental, they, they closed down their whole operations, took everybody out into a soccer pitch twice over a six month period, and you can see the kind of returns they were able to generate in just one year. Um, Roadway Express, on the other hand, is a trucking company. And here we're talking about warehousing and trucking, a highly unionized workforce that got engaged with them. Uh, and uh, over two years, they, they used the kind of processes I'm going to describe to you in 60 of their different sites. And in those sites that used these processes, they found they had seven times the cost savings of those that didn't. Um, so these are, you know, this is not... <laughs> stuff I'm just making up, it, it works. Um, and I want to talk to you about how it works. Right? And it doesn't work through the traditional sorts of change management processes that we teach in business schools or you read about it in change textbooks and that sort of stuff. Um, so where do they come from? Well, these results come from involving relevant stakeholders in new conversations about things they care about. And that's, that's the central piece of, of the message I'm going to give to you today, is that if you want to accelerate transformational change, it needs to engage the people who are, need to be part of the change, they need to be invited to the conversation about change, and uh, offer them real opportunities to innovate from the bottom up. You know, the uh, story that uh, your, uh, I guess, vice president of IT, I didn't catch his name, uh, talked about earlier this morning, about that there, that out in the workforce, the people on the front line have lots of great ideas for simple things that can make a difference. And we find accelerated transformational change happens when, when that energy and that motivation is unleashed in some way. And uh, creating more collaborative organizing processes that engage everyone will have to make those changes work in proposing the changes they want to make. Um, and uh, so, this sort of stuff has been going on for quite a while now, but it goes on under a lot of different names. And Bob Marshak and I, Bob Marshak's at American University, about five years ago, actually ah, 10 years ago now, started exploring what was similar about all these different things. And we came up with this term, we call it dialogic organization development. And there are a lot of different dialogic organization development methods out there. Um, these may all be um, not familiar to you, um, uh, the ones I've highlighted in red are ones that I know healthcare authorities in British Columbia have used in one place or another. Um, and if you know anything about these sort of methods, they, they all look quite different. Uh, some of them look almost opposite, really, in, in the sort of steps of change that they offer. But what Bob and I have been able to demonstrate is that actually if you open the hood and you look at what's going on underneath these different techniques, they're the same change processes, the same mindsets, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today 
is what those are that lead to this sort of change. Lots and lots of examples of where these sort of change processes have been used. They've been used by virtually every progressive business organization you know about. Um, they've been used to improve sustainable development. Uh, Walmart, uh, whether or not you like Walmart, uh, they have made a, uh, a big bet on becoming the most sustainable company on the planet. They've engaged large numbers of their supply chain in these sort of dialogic organization development processes. Uh, just to give you one example, they, they, you know, if you know what happens uh, in the sale of, of newspapers and magazines, uh, what happens is at the end of the day or the end of the week, whatever they haven't sold, they cut off the label, they cut off the title, and they throw the rest away. And they said, well, this is just too much waste. And you can imagine, how do you, how do you stop that practice, which is endemic to that whole industry? And uh, Walmart has the clout to be able to get uh, 600 different players in that supply chain into a room engaged in, in completely changing how that works to eliminate that amount of waste. Um, it's been used for global change. I don't know if you're familiar with the United Nations Global Compact. This, um, this happened around 2000. Kofi Annan invited hundreds of the senior leaders of the major corporations on the planet to come to uh, the United Nations. And his, his challenge to them is how do we unite the, the uh, intelligence of markets with the needs of the planet to, to create you know, change that's sustainable for everyone? And um, over a two-day period, the CEOs of, of some of the largest corporations in the world evolved what became known as the Global Compact, which are 10 principles that they, they pledged to live by in their business dealings. And uh, since then, uh, thousands and thousands of corporations have signed up to the Global Compact, and they've implemented monitoring processes so that also thousands and thousands of companies have been thrown out because they didn't live up to these uh, particular uh, values. Uh, and in healthcare, uh, some examples, you may recognize Cleveland Clinic, Centers for Disease Control, American Cancer Society. These are just a few I was able to glean going through Google in about 15 minutes. So um, this is, this, the stuff I'm about to describe to you now, um, it's not like it's new, but it's still very much an exotic process, and I have some ideas about why that is. Well, for one thing, that, that list of dialogic organization development processes I showed you a few slides back, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And uh, Bob and I became very interested in why is that? What is going on when they work and, and when they're not working? What's going on? And one of the things I become convinced in the data we've looked at is one of the central things that's responsible for whether or not these works is something I'm calling generative leadership. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about for the rest of today is what is generative leadership and what does that look like? Um, and we've become convinced that generative leaders, the people who can provide the kind of leadership that make these transformational processes work, are operating from a different mindset than what I would call a performance mindset. And a performance mindset is the kind of mindset we need at the front lines. We need to get stuff done. We need to uh, meet targets. We need to hit goals. We need to figure out how stuff's going to happen. And people who are successful doing that get moved up the hierarchy. And the problem is, as you get further away from the front line, many of those sorts of mindsets aren't that effective, particularly for managing transformational change. Um, but um, the other thing I want to say about this is the, the, that uh, the generative mindset is not just required of executive leadership. It can be used at a team level. It can be used in, in you know, chunks of an organization. And what these leaders do, and I love this generative, this generator metaphor. It's given me all sorts of ways to spin this off. They, you know, they, these are people who create energy for change. They're like step transformers. They're, they're like dynamos. Like when generative leaders are around, um, people's motivation and intent and willingness to get engaged in making something happen ha you know, just increases. And what they do is they support the emergence of new patterns of organizing uh, and create the condition for new ideas to surface. Because the most powerful force for change is a new idea. Right? And when we face problems, and there are problems that seem intractable, people have been you know, going at them for a while, what makes the difference is a new idea that captures our imagination and makes us want to do something different. And 
And, and what I've noticed is that typically in the transformational change process, the new ideas that make a difference emerge from within the system. Because when they come from outside the system in, then you get a lot of that resistance sort of dynamic that goes on. When they emerge from within the system, it, it might be, it's not a new idea in the, in the history of the world, but in this system, it's a new idea and it, and it gains a certain kind of traction. I wanna talk about how that happens. Now, fundamentally, I think, there's a, there's a difference in the mindset of these leaders that I've been studying. And it's different from what I would call the dominant mindset. And this is the dominant mindset. This is what we teach in business schools. This is what you read in virtually every you know, McKinsey quarterly and this sort of thing. We talk about organizations as if they're things that we can put together and take apart. You know, they have processes, they have technologies, they have a structure, we can, uh, you know, and if we, just, if we just put the pieces together in the right way, given the environment that we operate in, then things will move, will move well, you know? And so there's a conversation about organizations in this sort of abstract sort of way. And we, we talk about people as if they're independent, autonomous beings who make decisions and, and make choices and take actions, either as individuals or as groups. And, uh, and that whether or not you know, uh, good change happens depends on wise heroic leaders whose vision and acumen steer the organization towards success. Um, and, um, and that using rationality and analytic ways of making decisions and using good group process, we're gonna create alignment and clarity and march forward into a new future. Well, a generative leader sees the world a little differently. Right? What the generative leader sees is organizations as conversations. That organizations are a flow of conversations that have been going on for a while. They're a way of making sense of the world. That in ten, you know, inside these conversations are narratives. And these narratives are stories that people use to make sense of what's going on. And that we are sense-making beings. We make sense of what's taking place. And that the sense-making we do and the meaning-making that we make out of things has as much or more impact on the results we create as any sort of objective technological process sorts of things. And I'm sure you're aware of this. It's like, you know, one leader gets up and says, I have a great vision, I'm going in this direction. And people in the audience go, that's great, I'm behind that. And another leader in another organization gets up and says exactly the same thing. And people go, I don't trust this guy. Right? I have a different story. Right? That, the, that how we hear things, how we make sense of things, is very much based on these conversations that are taking place. And the generative leader, rather than seeing themselves as, as an independent, autonomous being, you know, is aware of our interdependence and how, how little room we actually have for taking action independently, that we, are, that we both constrain and enable each other, right? that we need each other and we can't get much done without each other. And so organizations are relational realities where the relationships that exist and the meaning making that's taking place through those relationships is far more significant for understanding what happens and how we manage change and how we create the, the, the kind of organization we live in than any sort of objective uh, structural technological process sorts of things. And therefore no one can control what everyone else is choosing and doing and leaders often feel powerless to influence their own organization for its own good. I've worked with a lot of senior leaders who they, they know what they want to do. They know what the right thing is. They'd like to make it happen, but it's just not that easy. And I'm sure many of you had that experience as well, that far from being purely rational, people are emotional. Right? And that uh, I, you know, I've said for many years, the number one force in organizational life is anxiety and the avoidance thereof. You know, uh, the things that people do, the choices they make about what they say in a meeting and what they don't say in a meeting and how they act and how they don't act is a lot about how do we avoid anxiety, not about so much the rational ideas we have about what we should do. And so while we talk about generalizable tools and techniques, and you know, I'm sure you know, agile, lean, total quality management, balanced scorecard, they come around every couple of years and people get all excited about them as if this new tool or technique is gonna make a difference for us. And uh, we believe that the results are gonna come from the choices and intentions and strategies made by our leaders and the teams. And even though in this narrative, we talk about uncertainty and ambiguity, we recognize just this morning, your, your, uh, your CEO got up and said, there's a new, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty facing us at the moment. And we recognize that. 
And then we sort of forget that, and we proceed to act and encourage others to act as if there was certainty, as if there was predictability, as if we could control things. Well, the generative leader says, you know what? The situations we're in are so uncertain, and the contingency is so important. And what I mean, you know, it's like, okay, well, here's this new idea. It's total quality management. It sounds great on the surface, but you know what? Uh, we got these people, and we've got this situation, and we've got this government thing happening over here, and we've got that stuff taking place here. And, and the situational constraints that anyone in any organization faces, and the local contingencies are so important that it turns out these generic tools end up having very limited value, at least from the point of view of the, the generative mindset. And rather than seeing results emerging from you know, wise heroic leaders who have a vision, who create alignment, get everybody moving in that direction, it seems like results actually happen from an interplay of forces. It's like, it's like organizations are this large billiard table where balls are careening off each other all the time. And sometimes they fall in the pockets and sometimes they don't. And so we end up being in a situation where sometimes we're surprised, Donald Trump, and sometimes we're not. Okay? And, that, and that organizational life has a certain predictability to it, and then every now and then it doesn't. You know? So my question to you is, you know, looking at these two sort of ways of looking at the world, you know, how do leaders in your organization talk about organizing and managing? More like the left-hand column or more like the right-hand column? And what's your experience of life and organizations like? More like the left-hand column or more like the right-hand column? And when leaders plan for change in your organization, which set of assumptions are being acted on? And how's that working for you? So I'm gonna invite you to just turn to the person next to you and just talk about your reaction to that for a few minutes. Thank you. So I'm sure in the room right now there's a range of folks. There's probably some folks in here who very much operate from this generative mindset, even if it's never been labeled that for you before, uh, to those who are very suspicious of this uh, right-hand column. Uh, for, the, for the generative leaders in the room, I'm about to give you more ammunition. For the, uh, those of you who are very suspicious, I'm gonna try to uh, provide some, some other ways of thinking about this. And it starts with a fellow by the name of Ron Heifetz, who is a, a professor at, at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's written a number of books. And, uh, he, he doesn't put it this way, but this is how I reinterpret his work. I would say that generative leadership is necessary for managing something he calls adaptive challenges. And one of, I think, Heifetz's most important contributions to this conversation has been this distinction he's made between technical problems and adaptive challenges. Now, I'll ask you to just take a minute and look at the, the, the column called technical problems and look at the problem called adaptive challenges. And notice, what's different about those? What's the difference between a technical problem and an adaptive challenge? Okay, well, I'm about to tell you what the difference is, so. <laughs> Let's see how you did, but one of my favorite sayings from Heifetz is he says, the single biggest failure of leadership is to treat adaptive challenges like technical problems. And I think one of the reasons why the kind of adaptive challenges that are on this and, and so many more, the reason they seem like intractable problems is because we use the rationality of, of, of technical change methods to try to deal with them. Right? When we're dealing with a technical problem, you know, it's, it's typically easy to operationally define. How do you lift a patient so that you don't strain your back? And we, can, we can define that. And technical problems lend themselves to sort of process and procedure kinds of solutions. Right? And people are generally receptive to a new idea, a new technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, we still can run into some of the sort of resistance to change issues, but um, you know, often you can, you can use authority or you can use expertise. And these sorts of changes generally only require change in one of a few places that can be mandated they can be implemented relatively quickly, right? And one of the nice things about technical solutions to technical problems is they stay solved until something else comes along to change the situation. But adaptive challenges are quite different. Right? To begin with, it's often difficult to agree on what the problem is, right? If we're trying to increase collaboration between different units, what's the problem? Why aren't we getting collaboration? Well, people have very different ideas about why that isn't happening and what needs to happen next. And whatever's gonna have to happen to increase collaboration or to get patients taking their meds or that thing, sort of stuff is gonna require changes in values and or beliefs and or roles and relationships or in mindsets. 
And while people will be fairly open to you coming along and giving them a new tool for how to do something, people generally resist uh, when you come along and say, here's a new way you ought to think. Here's a new value you ought to take on. Okay. That in order for that sort of change to happen, the people with the problem have to be involved in solving it. Right? Because people don't resist change, but they resist being changed. Right? Change that comes from the inside out is much more rapid and much more transformational than change that we try to impose on others. And so, and the thing about adaptive challenges is typically they require changes in numerous places across organizational boundaries. Right? If we're going to get patients to start taking more responsibility for taking their responsibility for taking their meds, it's not just something that the hospital is going to, they've got to get their, their support system involved, maybe pharmacies need to be involved, you know, maybe family doc. There's going to be numerous different groups and stakeholders that are going to have to be involved in actually making that change happen. Now, and this is important, adaptation, the, the taking on of adaptive challenges requires experiments. It requires trying stuff out. And that means there are going to be dead ends and wrong turns, and, and we'll try stuff, and it's not going to work. And if we think that in order to create change, we've got to have the right answer, and it's got to be the right answer, then we get paralyzed by adaptive challenges. Because, and I'm going to talk about this later, no one initially knows what the right answer is. And finally, and this is really important, right, any solution to an adaptive challenge is going to create a new problem. Right? It's like... This is fundamental to, to the nature of organizing people, because people aren't simple stimulus response mechanisms. Right? People, people are messy. <laughs> right? any, any solution to a problem of organizing creates a new problem. Right? That's just the game. Right? And so some of you have been around long enough, you probably had this experience of, you know, we decentralize, and then we centralize, and then we decentralize, and then we centralize. Because yeah. right. right. every time we make one of those moves, we were solving a set of problems that the last thing made, and now we're, you know, but now we create a new set of problems that we need to go in the opposite direction. That's just the yin and yang of organization. Right. So generative leaders understand this that any solution to a problem of organizing is going to create a new problem, and therefore, any change process is as much to increase the adaptive capacity of the organization as it is to solve that particular problem, that both those things are in operation, and that rather than searching for the answer that's going to solve it all forever, generative leaders search for any answer that stakeholders are willing to move on, to move the ball forward. Secure the knowledge that organizational change is, is, is ongoing. Right. One of the unfortunate things that happened in American social science in the 20th century was this idea of organizations as stable entities kind of emerged, that periods of change were things that happened, and then we went back to stability or equilibrium or homeostasis, a lot of these nice biological terms. And that's one way to look at things, but I, I think what the increasing pace of, of, of complexity and volatility and uncertainty has kind of shown us, saying, eh, you know, Anything that looks like stability is just slow change. <laughs> you know? That organizations are constantly in a process of change and multiple changes taking place simultaneously. Some planned, some not. Right? Some intended, some unintended. And that's part of the complexity of what we're dealing with. And generative leaders have a, more, have, have a sense of that. That as we try to create a change, we're diving into a flow that's already in flow. And um, small wins are great because they keep us moving the ball forward and new things will show up and that it's as much about a process of learning as it is about a process of solving things. Um, some of you who are, anyone in this business knows the dirty secret of organizational consulting is that only about 20% of change processes ever actually succeed. And those are ones where you have a lot of leadership involvement. There's been about three major studies done in the last 20 years that have come up with the same number. Four out of five organizational change processes fail. In fact, it's so bad. I once, I once worked for a um, very successful uh, large corporation that had been kind of a sleepy provincial Canadian company and went through over a 10-year period, went from that to being a major player in a high technology business uh, ha fast, agile, adaptive, lean, and no leader in that organization could, could create, could take any um, responsibility for any of those changes that had taken place, that it had all been forced on them in the environment. In fact, it was so bad that 
uh, no leader in that organization would agree to champion any change process because they knew it would inevitably fail. Right? They had so many experiences of that. However, here's the good news. That sort of result only happens when leaders define the change. Right? Where now, and part of what my research is showing, is that when stakeholders define the change, and by stakeholders I mean the people who are going to be impacted by this change, who are going to actually have to make the change, that are going to have to support the change, when you have those people actually defining the change, not the leaders, but the stakeholders, right, that you actually get lots of successful change. Right? And when leaders lead that process, it almost always works. Here's the good news. You can almost always create transformational change when leaders are leading the process and where the stakeholders are engaged in an effective process of defining what those changes are. And I want to describe some of that in more detail to you. The important thing is that generative leaders do not supply the answer. They frame the question. Right? Let me give you a profound example of that from the business literature. It's a company I'm sure you've all heard of. It's called Monsanto. Now, a lot of people don't like Monsanto, but understand that in the early 90s, Monsanto was a failing conglomerate of a lot of disparate little companies that had nothing to say to each other. They were in agribusiness, they were in research and development, they were in chemicals, and none of them were doing very well. And a new CEO, Robert Shapiro, came in, and he said, I don't have the answer, but what I think we need to do as a company is we need to feed a hungry planet. How are we going to feed a hungry planet? Now, that was a galvanizing question for that company. Right? And while we may not like the solutions they came up with, there's no question that that organization transformed rapidly, right? producing amazing results and overtaking competitors far larger and far more entrenched than they were. Um, right? So the generative leader, their job is not to say, here's the answer, follow me. Their job is to say, here's the issue, and to hold that space of not knowing and complexity long enough so that we bypass simplistic solutions and create an opportunity where real solutions that can really make a difference emerge. Right? Now, as a result of which, the generative leader doesn't provide the content of change, but they provide the process of change. And, they have to, and, and these things only work when leaders get very involved in that piece of the business of how are we going to orchestrate a set of conversations among which people to get us to a point where new ideas emerge that people are willing to act on to make a difference? And that's what Dialogic OD does, in a nutshell. It's an emergent process where leaders mobilize stakeholders to self-initiate action and then monitor and embed the most promising initiatives that, that emerge. It's a kind of a bottom-up, leading-from-behind move. And it's 90% successful, according to the data I have. And fundamentally, it means whoever's going to have to change needs to, be, needs to be invited to the conversation. It doesn't necessarily mean they show up to the conversation, but it means they've been invited to the conversation in some way or another. Right. In uh, early 2000, Anik Kassam and I did a study where we looked at 20 of what were in the uh, academic literature at that time considered successful large-scale change events. Well, when we looked at it, we decided really only a third of them were actually transformational in the way I described to you earlier. You know, within a year or two, massive sort of changes had occurred. And we looked at 45 different variables in those cases and sliced and diced it, and there was only three that emerged that actually differentiated these two sites, and one was that they used an improvisational or what I'm calling an emergent approach to change. And the second one is something that I call a generative image, uh, emerged. And I'm going to describe both of those to you now in a little bit more detail. An implementation approach to change is where, and, and you can use an engagement strategy and still do implementation. You get a bunch of people in the room, get a bunch of ideas, and then the leaders move in, and they start to pick winners, and they decide what the good idea is. They identify the change they want. They form action teams. They generate plans, create milestones, reporting deadlines, and everybody experiences frustration. Right? And the result of that, we say to ourselves, change is hard. Now, in those one-third of those cases that sh had actual transformational outcomes, they did something quite different. They got people in a room, they asked them to think about the issue that they cared about, generated a collective sense of what needs to be achieved, created opportunities for people with ideas and motivation to find each other, unshackle them to do whatever they think is right, and pay attention to what's working and get behind it, and what they discovered was faster change than we thought possible. 
And this is the key thing. In these engagement events, the leaders bring people into a room to talk about stuff they care about, to find other people who have the same ideas they have, to propose a change, and the leader says, good, go do it. Go do it tomorrow. Right? You got an idea? We're not, we're not going to vet these. We don't want to hear about it. Just go do it. You know what needs to get done. Go do it. Right? And then the next step, and this is critical, is they, is they put in processes to monitor and track what's happening so that they're able to support you know, it's sort of like gardening, you know, fertilize it, give it water, pull out the weeds, this sort of thing. Um, one example from this study, GTE, which is now Verizon, in one year's time, using these sorts of change processes, over 10,000 innovations were counted in one year's time from unshackling the front line. Now, the whole GTE process started as an attempt to develop better labor management relationships um, with the union, a very highly unionized workforce. I just recently completed a, a consult, consultation with a, a materials construction, very unionized, very cynical, been around a long time. Uh, within six months, transformed that, that culture to the point where the head of supply chain was calling me up going, I just walked into the warehouse, there's guys walking around in the yard, they're, they're changing all the design of the yard so that we can accomplish this goal we have. Nobody told them to do it. <laughs> and they didn't ask for permission, they're just doing it. He was stunned. So why does that work? Why does this emergent change process work? Well, here's one model that helps explain it. This is from Dave Snowden, who at the time he developed this model was the uh, head of knowledge management at IBM. Um, and he says, look, it depends on, do we know what the cause-effect relationships are? And he says, he defines five different decision situations. And what he defines as a simple decision situation is we know what affects what. Right? We, know, we know this kind of bacteria is going to have this kind of effect on the human body, and when we have that kind of a situation, then it's really a matter of we need to sense, you know, we need to understand what the situation is and categorize it into what we know how to do and then respond. And he says it is only really in this particular quadrant where best practices make sense. Now, I don't know what it's like in this organization. I work in some organizations where best practices has become the sacred talisman that uh, nothing can get proposed unless it's a best practice. Well, I'm here to tell you folks that best practice, again, we are not simple you know, uh, stimulus response mechanisms. Best practices only work when you're dealing with a simple decision situation. Uh, now, a lot of the ones we face with are complicated. And a complicated decision situation is one where we haven't already categorized the right response. But if we apply expertise, we go and we do a diagnosis, we collect data, we analyze it, and then respond. That's, that's the way to do it. And these are ones where we can figure out what the cause-effect relationships are if we apply you know, the, the, the tools and, and the methodologies we have. Um, and that's, where, that's the realm of technical problem. And that's the realm of where many of the sorts of, of, of uh, problem-solving tools and change methodologies that we teach in our business schools work. But, in complex situations, what we got here, and, and the way he would define a complex situation, I agree with him, is a situation where we don't really know what will affect what, except in retrospect. Right? Like you can see right now, there's a whole lot of analysis going on. How did Trump win the presidential election? In retrospect, we can look back and start to come up and make some sense of that, right? even though nobody predicted it to begin with. It's a complex situation. Right? And. Uh, some people would argue as soon as people are involved, you've got a complex decision situation. <laughs> you never know what affects what. But um, Snowden's um, solution to how you deal with that decision is first you send out a probe. And a probe is try something. Try something, a little thing. You can call them experiments. In this uh, warehouse uh, case I just finished, we called them pilot projects. Try a pilot project. And the important things about probes is they're not intended to succeed. They're intended to learn. Now, if they succeed, great. Then you follow it up and you do something. Right? But a probe is a move to try something so that we can see in this situation what affects what. And this particular strategy to decision making, change, whatever you want to call it, has been showing up now in the strategy literature for about 15 years. Uh, and if you look at the strategy literature and the solutions that they're offering to how do we deal with complexity, there are two. One is, let's take a complex situation and pretend it isn't complex. 
so that we can use, so we can treat it like a complicated one and use those methodologies that we all like and feel comfortable with to try to deal with it. Maybe that works. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic on that one. Uh, the other one that comes up is this idea of probes. A recent example is um, Jim Collins. Some of you may know Jim Collins' name. He's written some very popular books. One was called Good to Great. His latest book is looking at organizations that thrive in uncertainty. And Collins, Collins has a particular research methodology. It's very powerful. What he does is he picks, he looks for 10 companies that over a 20 year period have thrived in an uncertain and complex and volatile environment. He finds those 10 companies. And then he looks for 10 other companies that 20 years earlier were exactly the same situation as these successful companies. Same business, same size, same market cap, doing essentially the same thing that didn't succeed and then does in-depth case studies of both to try and understand what's the pattern here. And uh, one of his conclusions about companies that thrive in uncertainty, he calls it, first they fire bullets, then cannonballs. Right. Again, what he means by that is the companies that thrive in uncertainty, they would take a shot, take a shot, take a shot. Oh, we hit something, bring in the cannon. Then we make a big bet. Um, and then you have chaotic situations where there is no cause-effect relationship discernible, and, uh, he, and someone says the best thing to do here is to just do something and then see what happens. That's your only option. And I, I would say these are the realms of adaptive challenge, and these are the realms where these sort of dialogic engagement change processes work. Um, now, Probably you've never heard of dialogic OD, and not a lot of people have. It's a new label we're using to describe a bunch of things and put it together. But you know, this stuff's been going on for about 30 years now, and uh, there are hundreds of successful cases, increasing academic research that's showing that this is a much more effective way to transform a system. And yet, it's still experienced as exotic by many executives. And one of the questions I started asking myself a couple of years ago is why? Why is that? And I think one of the reasons is because our image of leaders is that they're visionaries. And that if they don't have a vision, they're not leaders. Right? You pick up just about any book or any article on leadership and the word vision pops up. It started around the late 40s. It's become, uh, and if a leader doesn't have a vision, they're not a leader. But see, the emergent change is the opposite. It's not guided by a visionary, but instead by someone who says they don't know the answer. And that's a very courageous act. Talk about daring to innovate. For a leader to get up and say, I know what the problem is, but I don't know the answer. And I want to invite you in, into this risky, emergent situation. Where I have no control over this. No one, because, but they're operating out of a mindset that says no one has any control anyway. You know, that's all illusion. But this whole control thing is a way of managing our anxiety. Now, the thing about it is that a lot of people don't like it. I'm studying right now a fellow in Seattle who has been able to create organizations that are employing large numbers of people with intellectual developmental disabilities and do it in a way that creates competitive advantage. These businesses are outperforming their competitors. And he's my poster boy for a generative leader at the moment. Like he, he lives this complexity stuff and he lives emergence. And this is the way he's, he's led this organization. And now they're, they're like a social enterprise conglomerate. They've got six businesses operating now. But there's a lot of people in that, in, those, in that organization who do not understand him and do not like what he's doing and think he's a terrible leader. Right? And in the process of me studying this guy, one of his senior directors took a run at him, tried to get the board to fire him because he's such a terrible leader. Right? And the board doesn't understand what he's doing either. Right? But they got together and they looked at the data and they said, on every measure we have, this organization is doing better than it has ever done in its history. So we're going to stay with them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? But it takes a, an extraordinary person, I think, to have not only that courage, but have that self-possession and say, you know, and this guy is basically retired and took over this thing because he cared about it, but to have that kind of, that, that place where they're willing to stand in that place of not knowing, of holding uncertainty and complexity and forcing, because he was the kind of, people would come up to him and go, well, is it this or that? And he'd say, yes. You know, people hate that, right? But it's part of what a generative leader does. For most of leaders, others expect you to have a vision. They expect you to tell them what to do. And if you don't know what to do, and if you aren't able to tell them what to do, you're a bad leader. So leaders end up sucking up the responsibility and others are happy to give it to them. Okay, yeah. 
you're in charge, you tell us what to do, and if it doesn't work, it's all your fault. Right? And when things aren't working well, who's responsible? They are. Yeah, they need to get their act together. I think we need a new story of leadership, and that's part of my, that's why I'm talking to you today, that's why I want to talk to people about it, is that we need to unleash those in you in here who are, who have the potential to be generative leaders. To provide a story to the people you report to and the people who report to you about how to manage adaptive challenges, and that it's not about you having a vision, because you know what? Here's the problem with the vision thing. Nobody knows if the vision is any good until years down the road. For every Steve Jobs, you know, Lehman Brothers had a vision. Remember Lehman Brothers? Almost caused the collapse of the financial system. Right? <laughs> Blackberry had a vision. Right? Nortel Networks had a vision. They all had visions. Right? Right? It is true that if you have a compelling vision, if you're able to offer people a way of seeing the future that is compelling to them, you can create followership. And if you define leadership as the ability to create followership, that is leadership. The problem is, a lot of, for every great vision, there's 100 that fail. And in the Jim Collins uh, study, all those failing companies that failed at uncertainty, they all had vision. They made big bets, big bets on stuff, and they turned it out wrong and wiped out a whole lot of wealth and uh, people's jobs and so on and so forth. Right? It, I, I'm almost ready to get to the point where I'm saying, you know what? In a complex, uncertain environment, visions are dangerous. Right? Maybe they're the last thing we need. But we want them because they make us feel comfortable. They make us think that we know what we're doing. It, it creates the illusion of certainty to step into an always unknowable future. Where do generative images source these ideas from? How do they, how do they show up? Well, I want to give you, for me here, an iconic example. Before 1987, those of you who are old enough as I am to remember this, environmentalists and business people had nothing to say to each other. Right? Environmentalists all thought business people were crazed idiots who were driving Spaceship Earth into a death spiral, and business people all thought environmentalists wanted to live in agrarian peasant societies on a beach and eat bananas, and they had nothing to say to each other. And then in 1987, something happened that so transformed that narrative that across North America, Western Europe, after years and years of screaming, listen to us, listen to us, all of a sudden business government turned to Organizations like Greenpeace and said, okay, we're listening. What should we do? Right. That change was so profound and so rapid that Greenpeace Canada literally almost fell apart because then people are going, eh? you know, what do we do? Do we join the boards of companies and certify the greenness of their processes? You know, do we trust these people? It took them about 18 months to sort out that now they weren't going to do that. They were going to stay in an advocacy role. But my question to you is, what created that change? Here's what I think it was. A UN report, of all things, called the Brundtland Commission, offered us a generative image. And that generative image was sustainable development. And all of a sudden, business people could say, I'm, I'm for sustainable development. And the environmentalists could say, I'm for sustainable development. And all of a sudden, we had, an, we had a new idea that was compelling and attractive and it generated new action, and it generated new ideas. It's the iconic generative image of our time. 25 years later, it's still throwing off innovations. Right? It's still generating new ideas and new ways of acting, and, and, uh, and, and no one can define it. Because that's one of the core properties of a generative image. Right? A generative image is an unusual combination of words. Now. Any image to be generative has to be, is generative within the context in which it's used. So a combination of words that might be generative in one organization might not be in another. Sustainable development is very, very unusual in, in, in that generative capacity is had worldwide. One of the places that I often find generative images is when you take things that people have been stuck either or around and you stick them together. Right? People go, well, we can either be centralized or we can be decentralized. And some organization comes along, let's, let's create decentralized centralization. Right? And it's like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, if that's compelling, and actually I, I have one case in my latest book where that's exactly what happened. Right? Uh, and I think it was a healthcare organization, actually, that, that, that decided to go for centralized decentralization. And right? it, 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 was, it, it seemed like 
And you know, generally, if you look at sustainable development, it's the same thing. It's, it's taking two opposites. At the time, environments, we can either you know, save the planet or we can develop economically. We can't have both. And you took an either-nor situation and stuck them together. That's not the only place to find a generative image, but it's, it's one of the hottest ones. And, right? But that image has to be compelling to people. It calls on something we care about. And to me, that's the most important thing. If you want to create transformational change, you got to frame it in a way people care about. If they don't care about it, it's not going to happen. Right? And all too often, leaders frame the changes they're interested in some kind of techno-speak that uh, just, just has no energy to it. Um, so what these generative images do is they open up opportunities for new productive conversations. They create a space where people who need to be part of the conversation want to come to the conversation. Right. Um, they go, well, we want to talk about sustainable development. You want to come? Right. Yeah. And then we start talking about what is it? And one of the things that makes you know, uh, a generative image generative is that it's ambiguous. The Beatty School of Business decided about 15 years ago to make sustainability one of our core pillars. About a third of the faculty were adamantly against that. They thought it was crazy. No one can define it. Yeah. And, and to me, the whole point of a generative image is that it's, what makes it generative is that it, it has so many different facets to it. We can project into it. It can lead to things we never thought about before. And I want to give you a couple of examples. This is from British Airways. Um, and the question they had was, how do we get airline employees to identify and act on innovations that will make us stand out from our competitors? Right. Now, that's kind of a mouthful, you know. Uh, that's not necessarily going to get a lot of people excited. Um, and the generative image they came up, for, came up with for that one was, how do we create exceptional customer arrival experiences? And that was a lot more interesting to the frontline folks in baggage handling and, and uh, people on the planes and the people taking people's tickets. A lot of people got excited about it because one of the things you know, is that the people who are actually dealing with customers on the front line, they want to create great customer experiences. They want happy customers. They don't want people having to interact with a public that's pissed off at them all the time. Right? That was a generative image for them. This is the one I was just working on. How do we get unionized employees from all parts of the supply chain to generate and act on ideas for increasing the standardization of their work processes? Now, most people would think, that's, who wants to do that? Who wants to create more routines and standards, you know? Like if we said, hey, let's, you know, and this was, a, again, a cynical unionized workforce. And here's the thing they realized. They've been trying to standardize these work processes for years, right? And people wouldn't follow the rules. And once they finally gave up on the idea that they could control what other people were doing and they could control people following the rules, right? But they also realized that the core of so much of the pain that people experience, because in this organization, people are getting yelled at by their customers, and they had people higher up the food chain pounding on their heads, and because you know, so many of their processes were out of control, and there was a lot of reasons why that was. And, they, and if they could just standardize more, then things would be better. Here's what we came up with. Stress-free customer service. We put a call out to this workforce, so we'd like you to invite you into the room and talk about how do we create more stress-free customer service. And people wanted to show up for that conversation. Right? And they generated dozens of innovations. Right? Like, and, and it got to the point where, whoops, and I'm out of time. So I need to move. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on my last two slides here. So this is, this is kind of the, the final set of slides. How do generative leaders transform organizations? So first, they identify the adaptive challenge they are personally committed to managing. Because this is not going to be a short-term game. Right? It's going to be, there's going to be experiments, there are going to be dead ends, there's going to be wrong turns, there's going to be a bunch of small changes that accumulate over time, and you're never going to get it all solved. But you're going to build an adaptive capacity that can keep moving in that direction. They work through change agents. Because they're leaders, they've got a lot of other things they've got to be doing. So they need a few people who are their folks on the ground, who, and I say familiar with dialogic OD approaches, they don't even need to know the term dialogic OD. They just need to know something about emergent change. And they probably have their own way of talking about it. Who work and advise the leader on what to do. Then together, they use a generative image to frame the challenge in a way that stakeholders care about. Right? The way I would put it with my clients is I say, we need to frame this thing in a way that people would crawl over glass to be part of this conversation. Right? 
And it starts with figuring out what, what do people care about and how do we link that to the adaptive challenge we're trying to, to manage in some way. And then they bring those stakeholders who'll have to meet that challenge into conversations that allow people with similar interests and motivations to find each other. Because right? usually those are across boundaries or there are different parts of the organization. But those, those motivations, those intentions, that excitement already lies latent in the system. It just needs some air and people need to find each other and then give those people an opportunity to, to come up with some innovation or change they want to make happen and then say, go do it. And they hold that space of ambiguity and complexity and manage the anxiety that creates until new ideas that have a chance of succeeding emerge and, and thereby stimulating and encouraging as many probes as possible. Right? Little changes to see what works. They don't try to pick winners. Instead, they create a culture of experimentation and learning. So in this warehouse project, we said, you know, we're looking for pilot projects. They don't have to succeed. We don't expect everybody to be successful, but we do expect you to try. And we expect to learn something from this. As it turns out, most of them have been successful. They install processes for monitoring, learning, supporting, and embedding those successful experiments. Right, a process I call tracking and fanning. So it's an amplification strategy to change. You get something small that's working, you find ways to scale it up. And finally, they use the opportunity of managing this challenge to increase the overall adaptive capacity of the organization so that it's making change happen without them making to do anything. And that's my talk, and I am five minutes late. I apologize for that.